Good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, my name's Tony McGrew. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here at the University of Strathclyde. I'd like to extend to you a very warm and genuine welcome to the university, and in particular to our speakers, uh, but also to those of you from beyond the university, beyond the academy, and indeed even beyond the UK. I think this is the, the second in the series on this topic, uh, and I hope and I know in fact it will be as stimulating and provocative as the first one that I attended a couple of weeks ago, and I can see actually some familiar faces in the audience. Here at Strathclyde, we, we pride ourselves, and in particular the law school, our law school, prides itself on that engagement between academia and the professions. And I think that this seminar and the seminar uh, which we uh, hosted over a week ago is embodies, I think, that sense of engagement. And it, it's very important to us. We take it seriously because we think it enriches the academy. Uh, and I think the work of Cyrus Tata's Center on Law, Crime and Justice is an embodiment, I think, uh, of that virtue. Uh, but we also hope uh, and believe that it informs professional practice. And I think today's seminar, and tonight's seminar, is again an embodiment, I think, of that ideal. So uh, I don't want to extend my remarks too far, but what I would say is that I think in the first seminar we set the context for the debates, and I think in this second seminar what we're going to look at are some of the ethical and some of the broader issues uh, around electronic monitoring and its implications for sentencing and other aspects of legal practice. Uh, I did wonder at one point whether I should have taken any lessons from the first seminar about how I manage my academic staff in relation to uh, a kind of electronic monitoring, but I thought that would be an infringement of civil liberties, so I, I didn't take any lessons from that. But I, I'll listen very carefully uh, tonight. I'd like also to extend a particularly special uh, welcome to our chair of proceedings tonight, who I think is extremely, I'm already destroying the infrastructure, um, who's extremely, I think, well qualified to keep order, but also to keep us focused, I think, on the issues that we need to debate tonight. Mm -hmm. And he is, of course, as many as you know, Sheriff Tom Wal Welsh, QC, I should say. Yeah. And I'll just give you a brief bio for, for those of you who do not know him. Sheriff Welsh was appointed floating sheriff. I'm assuming that floating is a technical legal term rather than a description of some activity. But anyway, of South Strathclyde, Dumfries, Galloway, based in Hamilton in 2000. Between 1997 to 1999, he served as temporary sheriff throughout the whole of Scotland. Sheriff Welsh was admitted to the Faculty of Advocates in 1982, and he took silk in 1997. He's practiced in the Criminal Appeal Court.
um, how do you say that? Small pilots with that. Um, the pre-trial phase, court sentencing, final phase of detention and conditional release. That are the possibilities when it comes to electronic monitoring in the Netherlands. That's the phases in the, in the, in the criminal justice process where we use electronic monitoring. Um, and basically, what we, the most cases we see in the Netherlands is the pre-trial phase. And if you look at, uh, at the European treaties, um, um, uh, which, which count for, for judicial organizations, then Ar Article 4 of the European Treaty says that people should, as much as possible, uh, be in freedom before, uh, before they can go to trial. So we, uh, judges in, the, in that phase are, are, are more and more getting interested in using electronic monitoring because the principle that somebody should not be in jail in trial is not always possible. I mean, there are severe cases which you can't do that. But it's an interesting phase for electronic monitoring, and we get a lot of cases out of that. Uh, and also the, the conditional release, people get early out of jail with, with an in or exclusion zone. Our case are more and more uh, cases we see electronic monitoring on. Um, I'm going to go back later to that, but the main use of electronic monitoring in the Netherlands is on sexual offenders, violent offenders, and habit habitual offenders. Um, actually, we sort of decided in a new situation we're going to work with, that's the only target group we want to have electronic monitoring on. Um, we see pressure coming up from professionals who work with electronic monitoring. Um, uh, they, that's what we learned. They want more electronic monitoring than we think as judges or as, as uh, out of point of view of pro proportionality, which electronic monitoring should be used. So we, sh we said in the Netherlands, we only use it with average and high risk offenders. So not, er not any, any bond with any delict is eligible for electronic monitoring. That's a, that's a, that's a choice we made. Um, yeah? No. Well, this is, this, I can be short on this one, too. Uh, wh what we consider is the value of EM in the Netherlands, and I would be highly surprised if that would be different in Scotland, but um, as we consider EM as efficient and effective monitoring of compliance with court conditions eh, in our exclusion zones, uh, we consider EM, uh, that, shows, that shows research as well, the punitive character remains. It helps the structuring the life of, of offenders. It prevents some damaging effects of jobs and family, and it's less expensive than prison. And I get back later to that, it's less, exp less expensive than prison, but it's something completely different as prison as well. Um, but I come back to that later on with managing the expectations of electronic monitoring. Um, but these are basically considered, and there's among practitioners, among uh, researchers, there's, there's sort of consensus about the fact that this is where electronic monitoring, this is what the value of electronic monitoring is. Um, now this is a picture of somebody who's familiar in this area, I believe. But, I mean, one of the essentials of electronic monitoring, um, um, uh, is a and the, and Mike Nellis is, I think, one of the persons who, who inspired with that and who has a, a strong opinions about that, and I think he's very right, is that we believe in, in integration of electronic monitoring with probation supervision. The combination of electronic monitoring with evidence-based intervention is, is, was in the past and is still a strong belief in the Netherlands. And, I mean, this is, I don't know if that's uh, controversial in, the, in, in Scotland, but I, I, I believe that, for example, in the UK, uh, uh, people have different ways of dealing with electronic monitoring. But in the Netherlands, we believe that, that just the standalone using of electronic monitoring without the combination of probation supervision, without uh, going beyond the control of the electronic monitoring, but choosing evidence-based intervention, that's the combination we're gonna ha we have now, and I think that there's not much discussion about that. Um, the second part, the second essential of EM, I, 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 we decided to choose two, is, is the, the lessons we learned from since 1995, is to make the EM process as simple as possible. This is about, well, I hope this is a clear picture, this is basically from the, from the gold red, uh, the goal, I don't know if anybody knows the book from that, from that uh, uh, it's about the, 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 the theory of constraints, you always have to look at the weakest part of the chain, and that's how we looked at the EM process in the Netherlands, and one of the things we we learned since 1995, and I come back to that later, is that we think EM is, uh, if you look at all the different ways EM is being used in the world, all the different uh, uh, use there is, it's hard to compare a lot of use of EM. Um, even though we think in the Netherlands, if you, if you would, no, for example, if it would ask everybody in this room and make you separate in a different room and ask you what EM is, I'm pretty sure I would get around 100 different answers. I mean, so we, we, in Holland, we think since 1995, we made the EM process too complicated. And that's one of the reasons of the unfulfilled promises. It's too complicated, 
uh, it should be simpler, it should be easy. And then one of, one of the other things in the process we learned is it's very hard to make things difficult, but it's much more complicated in making things simple. So everybody knows what it is, how clear it is, how you're going to use it, what possibilities there are with EM. So that's one of the two essentials in the Netherlands we learned since 1995. That's the integration with probation supervision. And if you work on the EM process, make it as simple as possible. And I hope after what I show you, uh, the way how we're going to organize EM in the Netherlands, that you're going to agree with me and otherwise I'll probably get it back from you later on. <laughs> Um, so, the, from concept to product line of electronic monitoring, I mean, there's a lot of perspectives uh, on electronic monitoring. There's, there's, there's been research that's been done on electronic monitoring, and it's always about uh, what, what we think, it's always about, a, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's always from a certain point of, point of view. It's one, one thing uh, uh, about offender's perspective, or victim's uh, perspective, or the research about recidivism when somebody is on electronic monitoring. And, if we would do a real effort, we'd probably find some more perspectives on electronic monitoring. Um, what we try to do in the Netherlands is to redefine the concept of EM. What is electronic monitoring? What is the essence of electronic monitoring? And then we just, and, uh, um, because maybe I should say that as well, we got a chance in the Netherlands with, with the project to, to redesign the whole process. I mean, it's like, we, now this was the moment to do that, and, and we got the, the assignment from the Ministry of Justice to redesign the whole process. So we looked again at the concept of EM, what is EM, and we tried to redesign the EM process to make it as simple as possible. Um, let me see. Uh, we, did, we started our project in 2012 with, um, with a study of all the cases, and, and then what I mentioned, we use on not only RVD, but we also work with satellite tracking in the Netherlands. And one of the things we, we, we studied all the cases in our project, and we, we had a few, and this is, I only have half an hour, and I want to do the whole story, so that's, there was more to say than these conclusions. But these are the main conclusions we, we, draw. we draw. It's like, the one conclusion is that the technical possibilities are starting point when it comes to electronic monitoring instead of the goals that have to be achieved. Um, if you look at the techniques these days, if you, if you look at the possibilities, especially with satellite tracking, I mean, everything, there's a lot is possible. Um, but it does not mean uh, that, you, that everything that's possible, that's what you want. For example, we made uh, uh, an analysis of, of satellite tracking, of the use, how people work with it, and we saw that almost all the cases were different in the way they were handled, in the day where they were in the software. And that's not, this, that's not a problem if you work with 20 cases, but if you have 400 cases or 500 cases, then you're going to have a then you have a problem with that. So that's one conclusion we draw. We should think more of the goals we want to achieve instead of the possibilities of the techniques. That's one thing. Um, other thing we learned, I'm going to co come back later to that, is that fine-tuning is important in the EM process in the judicial chain. Judicial chain starts with the police investigation, starts with the, pros uh, uh, with the prosecutor, starts with court and sensing. It's very important that if you want to have a proper good intervention with electronic monitoring, it's important that the whole chain is, 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 is um, fine-tuned, the, the different elements in the chain. Um, what we also learned from the current cases, and just like what I learned from the UK, um, a lot of things are not in the news, but something goes wrong with electronic monitoring, it's in the news. And something goes wrong with satellite tracking, it's in the news. It's all over the place. So that's the, and, and we learned from the, from the current study, of the study of the current cases, that the risk on incidents in the, in the current practice is big. So these were the conclusions. So is th these are the, the conclusions we draw, drew from the study. And we said, look, this is what we got to work on. If this is this was a starting point for the start of, of uh, our project. Um, and this is about this is the, 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 the way to show about how important it is that when you start with electronic monitoring, it starts with a risk accession. Then there comes a pre-sentence report with an advice how to use electronic monitoring. And in Holland, judges uh, are usually follow the advice of the Dutch probation service when it comes to electronic monitoring, because they're not experts at all. They have to rely on the advice of the, of the people they consider as an expert. Then uh, you have to make sure that the company who does the electronic monitoring exactly does what the verdict of the judge does. So the, the, the whole chain, there's a lot of chances of things going wrong, so it has to be well done in the judicial chain if it comes to an intervention with electronic monitoring. Um, so what we did, um, we, we, after we'd drawn the conclusions, uh, the study we did on, on all the cases of electronic monitoring in 2012, we, we considered as there are four areas of improvement when it comes to electronic monitoring in the Netherlands. The first of all is the knowledge of electronic monitoring in the, in the judicial chain. That was what I said before, like, um, if, 
in general speaking, and I don't know how it is with the sheriffs in, in Scotland, but maybe that we come back to that later, judges in the Netherlands do not know a lot about electronic monitoring. They talk about, it's about, and it's not, it's not something that I hold against him because it's, it's hard. You have to make it simple for them. It has to be easy access to electronic monitoring. It has to be clear what you want. But average speaking, the judges in the Netherlands and their prosecutors, even the probation workers who work with electronic monitoring, do not have the clue of electronic monitoring. They talk about bracelets, they talk about schemes, they talk about front door. So that's, that's one thing uh, when it comes to electronic monitoring. The second part of it is the uniformity in EM practice. I, I, I said before that the study of, this, of all the cases of satellite tracking uh, showed us that there's almost no uniformity in electronic monitoring. That's hard, that's what I said before, that's hard to handle when you work with a, with a lot of cases. It's not bad if you have a project with 10 cases, <coughs> no problem, but if you want to make volume, you have to standardize to get the quality. Um, another part is that we, got, we chose a different approach to EM specialists in the Dutch probation service. I said before, <coughs> electronic monitoring is integrated within the Dutch probation service, but we have about 120 specialists of electronic monitoring in the Netherlands, and some of them handle 0 0.2 cases a year, which we consider not really as a specialist. We, we said we have to have less specialists. We have people who work in electronic monitoring, who build up routines. We, we want champions when it comes to specialists, so we're going to reduce the amount of specialists uh, uh, drastically. Also, the managing and the monitoring of the EM process was an issue as well. We're not going to get into that very uh, much, but it's, it's, we try to find, uh, 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 how do you say that? We try to choose an approach. Not only by saying we're going to change one thing and hope it's getting better, we're going to, we're going to change the whole process. And these were the areas of improvement we uh, decided to, uh, to work on. And that's what we did. So the, no, I'm going to go into all these areas a little bit, which you will show, try to show you what kind of solutions we came up with so far and the results we, we, uh, we, we, we know right now as we are. Because we, the production line I'm talking about, we're testing it now in three regions in the Netherlands. Uh, to see if it works. You're going to test first and then you see if it works. You're going to gonna change the, the process uh, um, depending on the evaluation of the test. But this is how far we get. First of all, um, we said we're going to have to have a change of mindset in the judicial chain. In Holland, it was um, until very recently, was the way that if there was not electronic monitoring, then the judges and the prosecutors said, well, the Dutch probation service doesn't, does not advise it. There's, there's not going to be pr uh, EM if the Dutch probation service doesn't do anything. That's a uh, a very lousy position for the Dutch Probation Service, strategic-wise, because the Ministry of Justice, the, the head of the, 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 the director of the Dutch Probation Service is, is assigned this to, to me, and he said, I'm in a bad position because I'm being blamed for no electronic monitoring in the Netherlands. So uh, we said we have to change the mindset of judicial change because we went looking into the legislation and into the rules, and, it, and it, there's nothing wrong in the Netherlands with a judge or a prosecutor to ask for electronic monitoring. But now they can sit uh, backwards and say, look, the probation officer doesn't do anything. Why should we do anything? So I said, we're going to change that. We, we're going we're gonna to change the concept of it. We build a web store, and I'm going to show you a little bit for judges and prosecutors <coughs> and probation workers so they can have easily access. We're gonna, we, actually, we changed the mindset. We said, look, uh, if we, we're going to make it a little harder for you. You have to do some things to get electronic monitoring. But, but um, uh, then we're going to promise you we're going to make it as good as possible for you. That, that's, the, that's the whole idea. Um, so we said the use of VM is a responsibility of all organizations in the judicial chain. And it's not, if there's not electronic monitoring, it's not to blame on the Dutch probation service. It's a responsibility. And the Ministry of Justice recently said, that's OK. I accept that. And that's how I want electronic monitoring done. Um, so we, what we did, um, instead of looking, um, I have to go back to that, it, there's a lot of possibilities when it comes to electronic monitoring. I showed them you before, in the pre-trial phase, in the detention phase, a lot of phases you can use electronic monitoring. But it's, it's, it's very hard for the Dutch probation service to give advice in all these all this moments in the judicial chain. So you have to, so that's why we, 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 have, we build a web store, um, and you can try to Google it tonight, but it doesn't work. Because it's, uh, we're, we're right now we're on the judicial network of the Netherlands. And um, I, I don't want to uh, discuss you, but I would feel sorry for you if you're two hours tonight all trying to find this website. But it's not going to work. Um, so let me see if I can get there. Now, first I'm going to, I'm, uh, before I'm going to a few more other places, before I go to the production line itself. So the, what the change of the mindset in the judicial chain was the first one. Um, uh, everybody, the whole judicial chain is, is uh, 
is responsible when it comes to uh, electronic monitoring and not just the probation service. One other thing, uh, and we mentioned that uh, before shortly, like um, people do not know exactly what electronic monitoring is. All people who work in the judicial chain have different opinions, there's a lack of knowledge, and, and people who work with electronic monitoring make in the software prototypes every time. Every case is new. There's uh, a, a, a point of view, from a judicial point of view, that might be interesting, because in Holland, proportionality. Uh, in Holland, we believe that it should not make difference if you live in the northern part of the Netherlands, where I live, or in the southern part of the Netherlands. It should not be dependable just of my personal preference how your electronic monitoring looks like. I mean, we think it's part of elementary, uh, uh, it has to be equally case, should be, should be treated equally. So if you get an exclusion zone in the Netherlands for a comparable delict in the northern part, which is completely different from the southern part of the Netherlands, we think there's something wrong with that. That's, 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 that's another thing. So we, should, we said we should have more uniformity in, in, in EM practice. And what we did to achieve that is we made nine expert meetings with judges, prosecutors, policy makers, probation officers, juvenile probation officers, psychiatrists even, and we, 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 we held nine sessions, uh, expert meetings, and we, we did every time the same. We said, look, there are a lot of techniques in the world, there's satellite tracking, there's alcohol remote control, there's RVD, but what do you want to achieve? What is your goal, what you want with electronic monitoring? That's what we did nine times, exactly the same way, and then we came to, um, uh, uh, we defined electronic monitoring in 11 products, based on two product groups. I'm going to go later with that. So the idea is that when, when in a few, in a couple, next couple of months, maybe in a year time, people will talk about the YAM in terms of, of, of recognizable things. Like I said, this is, this is a product one, this is product two. So you make it more easy and accessible for people uh, to talk about electronic monitoring. And, and it, it, what professionals say, and, I, and I, I slightly assume that professionals in Scotland don't differ too much from professionals in, in the Netherlands, they usually say, my case is unique. This is my case, and I should work on my case. We said that that, that is not completely true. So what we assumed in, uh, 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 before uh, the, these expert meetings that we would come up to sort of a 90% of consensus with all these professionals, how electronic monitoring looks like. And, and right, right now, we, and we're testing it right now, these, these, uh, these products, um, and we think that about, with these 11 products, we cover about 90% of all the wishes people have with electronic monitoring. So professionals who start with the techniques and say my case is unique, if, I think that can be changed to a fact like, look, uh, we, can, we have bigger advantages if we define it in certain products than the disadvantages of having a prototype and every case is different. So right now we're testing 11 products of electronic monitoring and the two product groups, I'm going to come back later to that. So that was the second part we tried. The first part was um, uh, 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 the knowledge in the judicial chain. The second part is uniformity in the EM practice. And, um, 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 I'm going to be short on this one because I want to go to you, with you to the web store pretty soon because I'm pretty sure I'm almost getting close to my half an hour. It's a different approach of EM specialists in the Netherlands. We, we say we only want a real specialist in the Netherlands. We're going to reduce the amount of, of probation people working on EM. We're going to bring it back with may maybe 80%. Um, uh, that's, a, that, that's the process we're in right now. Uh, the managing and monitoring of EM process, we're going to, uh, turn, we're going to turn around. Um, and basically what we did when it comes to electronic monitoring, this is sort of a summary of what, what, what I was trying to say what we do. We build a web store for judges, prosecutors, and probation officers when it, uh, they, can, uh, they can go to when they want electronic monitoring. Um, we defined electronic monitoring in 11 products. We made tools for the people who work with electronic monitoring. Um, I hope we have time for that. When, you, when, it, come the next, when it comes to when, the, when there's, uh, you have demand for electronic monitoring, and you go to the web store, and, then the, the, and at the end of the web store, we know exactly what you want as somebody who wants electronic monitoring. Uh, and then the next step is you have to look if electronic monitoring uh, is possible. If somebody has electricity, and if he lives not in a, in, in a mess, or uh, if he's not in a drug addict, and that kind of stuff. And we made a tool for that, that, that the, the choices he makes on that uh, automatically generates an advice uh, to the court uh, connected to the 11 products we were talking about. So we want to make, uh, remember what I said about fine-tuning the different things, we don't want people to make uh, a pro uh, a mistakes in the advice part, so we sort of automatically organize that. So we make, try to make the EM process as simple uh, as possible. Then afterwards, when a judge decides that electronic monitoring is going to be there, 
um, then the professional has to have information about uh, about what what electronic what the, the status is of his electronic monitoring. Does somebody have compliance? Does somebody have not compliance? And we um, well, I'm going to come back later to that, how, how that works and how we try to organize that. The essence for us was, let's try to make it simple. Um, then I go to the, uh, and actually, when we started building the, the, the web store when it comes to electronic monitoring, uh, and we didn't know that, it would be arrogant to say that we knew that, but we learned when you start thinking about easy access with a web store, and I don't know if somebody goes to Amazon.com here, you probably buy stuff at the internet, right, like everybody does. Um, you learn a lot from working on these web stores. Like if you do it wrong after the web store, you're never going back to a web store. So the, 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 back, the back office uh, after the web store for judges has to be good. Um, when you have a web store, uh, uh, if you look at, we looked at Zalando, the uh, uh, IKEA web stores and how the distribution is organized behind these web stores. It, it gives you more control on the whole process if you work with electronic monitoring. That's another thing we learned. Um, if you go to the web, uh, if, if the, I'm going to show that later on, if you go to the web store, but it creates uniformity because whatever you choose, you always end up in 11 products we defined for you. So you get the impression if you go to the web store that you can have all the what professionals want. You can have a lot of freedom, what, the, what they want, but it always ends up in 11 products. Now, well, there, there are more things that, 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 a, that a web store uh, shows us that, can, uh, that works. And now I would like to show it to you. And this is the secure part and see if it works. Okay, that works. Um, basically, this is what, uh, what's being tested right now in the Netherlands. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's on a secured network. And this is, the, this is for the judges. Um, th this is mostly for the pre-sentence, uh, pre-trial pre phase. This is what the judges can use it. They still have to get used to it. I mean, uh, it's like, do we have to do this? And uh, uh, it used to be easier. That's what we heard too. I said, no, well, you'll get used to it. Um, this is for prosecutors, they can uh, use, and this is for probation uh, uh, workers. Because we still think that probation workers, if they have a criminal case which they want electronic monitoring, we should make it as easy as them for possible to get electronic monitoring. So for example, if you're, uh, uh, um, this is what, um, uh, this is all in Dutch, so I, uh, I, I can say whatever I want, <laughs> so I've got to believe it anyway. I, I, I'll be honest, true. Did we, for example, we created just as usual website, we, we created a, a 0800 number for, for specialists. So if you have a question about electronic monitoring, you can always call them. Um, and what we said, for example, I take the, uh, uh, the prosecuting office, see if it works. Okay, and um, oh yeah, this, is about, uh, this is about the test area because if you, this, this one, oh, let me see. The whole website circulates on the internet for all judges and all prosecutors, and we don't want them all to use it, only in the test region. So this is what said, look, you can do whatever you want, but if you're not living in this region, nothing is going to happen. Um, so this is, this is, for example, and now think back about the, the problems, the areas we tried to, the, the solutions we tried to find. Uh, what, 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 what were we looking for in the, What were the areas of improvement? And one of the things we learned, like we don't want, in the Netherlands, we do not want every uh, uh, case on electronic monitoring. We said, we, uh, and professionals, uh, especially working with juveniles, the, uh, very passionate uh, professionals, which I, I deeply respect and appreciate, but when, they, when you give them electronic monitoring and the techniques, they want much more than we think that's, that's responsible. They want to have trails, they want to follow them wherever. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to watch this, so it looks a little impolite, but there's nothing to do. Um, so we, we uh, said, okay, we go, we're gonna have flow charts behind this website who are going to help us uh, get to the goals we want. So we said you can only have uh, uh, electronic monitoring for sexual offenders, violent offenders, and habitual offenders. One other thing that's, that's on the website, you don't see any techniques on the website. There's no satellite tracking here. It said, we said because, think back, what we try to do is think people from goals, and we say the, the use of satellite tracking or RVD is not an issue for a sheriff or for a judge. He, he wants something, he gets easy access, he gets what he wants, but the techniques is for the special. So you have to really work on this website to know more about the techniques. That's the idea. Um, there's also, uh, uh, we said lack of knowledge is one issue when it comes to electronic monitoring. So what we try to do is put knowledge on this web store. So it's easy for judges and prosecutors to know more about electronic monitoring. We, there's a list with frequently asked questions. It's still in the test, test version, so we're not, I mean, we're never happy with everything, but we want to make it even better than it is now. 
Um, for example, all the reg legislation and rules are going to be here. So you can, f what we try to do is make a center, a knowledge center when it comes to electronic monitoring for users in the judicial chain. When, um, when we, we, we tried this website with judges and prosecutors, we said, what do we have to do to, to, give, to make, you, make you want more uh, electronic monitoring? One of the things they said, uh, they, they, the discussions were always fun, and they said, well, what can the techniques do? Yeah, uh, what can we do? So said, now, wh what, then we will always go back to the question, what is, what, when are you more uh, willing to use electronic monitoring? Constantly in sessions with, 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 with judges and, and prosecutors. And the one thing they said is like, if you can explain to me in cases, in a brief way, what electronic monitoring in a case can do, what I can expect of it, then it would help. Okay, and, and we said, okay, then uh, we made profiles uh, about electronic monitoring, completely. Um, links. Oh, links. Okay. Um, we made profiles of what electronic monitoring uh, could do in cases. So, for example, this is Dutch. This is about violence in the public area, about people who, for example, um, uh, people who uh, commit crimes in areas. Uh, um, you, in, for example, in, in bars, which happens a lot in the center of cities, and you don't want them in the center of city anymore. For example, this is about, it's big in Holland, it's about um, uh, violent crimes, uh, robbery of stores and that kind of stuff. This is about stalking. And uh, we, in, in all this, in these profiles, and we're testing it right now, we're interviewing them afterwards to test now if these profiles are correctly. This is still not talking about the techniques. It's not talking about satellite tracking here. It's only talking about what is the, the, the what do you want with electronic monitoring? What's your goal? And that's being described in, uh, in, in these profiles. And now after the test, we're going to ask, was it clear enough for you? For example, and I don't know how it works with sheriffs in, uh, in Scotland, but I definitely know how it works in the Netherlands. Judges think in numbers, in articles of law books. So we had to make sure that we put, uh, be very detailed with articles where they could use electronic monitoring on. So this is, this is what they can choose of. Um, and, and for example, what we did, just to give them, uh, we have one f uh, uh, field that's not, it's open. Like if, if your case, if you think you have a unique case which does not fit in the profiles we made, this is domestic violence, by the way, the, the, the one uh, below there. If you think you have a case which does not fit uh, in, in the profiles we made, if, you, if you're a prosecutor, probation worker, or, or a judge, you can fill in your own profile uh, uh, and we, we still, uh, w because we think of all the measures we took, make it 11 products, uh, bring it back to, uh, um, uh, bring the specialist back, we can be a little more reliable with a, black, with a field that still has a case of somebody uh, who wants anything. Well, if you go, um, for example... Hey, just I a few more minutes, please. Oh, okay, okay, well, then I'll... What's that? Yeah? Yeah, there's it. Yeah. There's it? Oh, yeah. If they found a profile, uh, they can do this. They can go to, and then they get an easy, uh, they have to answer three or four questions. And these three, four questions, if they answer, uh, for example, uh, if they, the, the, the flow charge behind this is, to, is the questions they answer, we immediately know what kind of electronic monitoring they demand. One of the 11 products uh, comes always out of this. So, if, for example, if they say, uh, this is about, the first question here is, uh, do you want to protect a victim uh, uh, from a, uh, a victim against so, uh, somebody, and there's a high risk. And if you say yes here, uh, then we know you're in a product group, which, which means that the police has to respond immediately when something goes wrong. Uh, and but if you want, if you want that's for if you want an exclusion zone for somebody who cannot be somewhere, the next thing, to, if you say yes here, the next thing could be like, um, uh, do you want do you want somebody to keep at home at a certain time? And then you say yes again, and then then you come on a, on a menu which says like, um, uh, uh, okay, thank you for your reply of electronic monitoring. And the whole idea is that the electronic monitoring can be done within the next uh, couple of days, and if necessary, faster. So actually, I sh I, I'm not gonna show you the whole production line, I think, I'm, uh, because then I'm gonna make everybody mad in the schedule. Um, but this is, basically, th this is basically what we try to do to make EM more easy accessible for everybody, and make it in a more <coughs> modern way, and, and, and cover the, and I'm going to, the, I'm going to go to the conclusions. Now, one more thing. This is taking me a few seconds. These are the 11 products uh, of electronic monitoring. And the red group was the one, uh, is about the one if you want to protect the victim uh, and, and you think it's high risk and the police has to do something. If you answer the first question with yes, we know that you're in that other part. We know that you're there. We know what you want. 
if you have less high, inc high uh, uh, risk on uh, uh, offenders, then, it's, then you end up in a blue product group. Then there's, 11, then there's other possibilities of EM, but we're not as concerned with that. But in, the, in the left group, the police immediately has to respond. In the, in the right group, we know that if you come to the, to the probation service next day, they can tell you, look, you did something we didn't want you, but the risk is not that high. So that's, that's tr I, see, and I don't have time for that, but I could go to the expected results. I think you, you will give me that. Um, what, we, what we try to achieve with this, with this prod production line is to have more use VM through easy access. That's what we, we show. That's what we uh, considered. The second part is we, uh, we expect people to get less confused about electronic monitoring and make clearer and simpler what it is. So that's the, that's the uh, other part we uh, try to achieve. Um, we also, uh, the essential, what I said before, that we believe that it should always be an integration with work of the probation service and electronic monitoring. We think it's necessary to do what we do now to make a professional integrated within the Dutch probation service. Um, we also hope that we get more increased uniformity in the practice of EM. So it's easier to handle, more managerial, less thinking about techniques, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, we also, that's not, that's, that's not um, uh, for us it's important, less mistakes in the practice of EM. But as I said before, when something goes wrong with electronic monitoring, and I believe your colleagues in, in the UK have a lot of experience with that, if something goes wrong with electronic monitoring, it's all in the tablets and in the papers, and all the same. <coughs> Um, we're going to have a better monitor and, and, uh, and, and, and another thing is like uh, the management of expectations because um, and we talked about that with, uh, before a little bit. Um, what we try to do now um, uh, is to have, uh, to manage the expectation with electronic monitoring, with press and politics. It's not, it's, it's our opinion and a lot of times when electronic monitoring is being introduced as pure substitution for jail then it goes wrong because it is not uh, the same as jail. If you want to be, if you want to want to lock somebody in, into jail, you got to do that. I mean, if you want pure, if you if you want the, the, if you want to completely be secure, put them in jail. But if you're thinking about releasing somebody to society with an, with an, with a court condition like you have to be somewhere or you cannot be somewhere, then electronic monitoring is is uh, gets suddenly a very interesting tool in doing that. And people say uh, uh, people who who say it's nothing. That's not true. It's an extra possibility. Uh, but it's not substitution for jail, and you have to explain that, is our experience in the Netherlands, to the politicians and to the press, because they say, well, it's, it's easy, they sit at home, it's not in jail. Well, that's true. So they're not in jail, but it's better than nothing. I'm sorry, I run out of time. Mike is being very strict with me. He's showing me his watch. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much, Michael, for that absolutely fascinating uh, account of the theory and the history uh, associated with electronic monitoring uh, in Holland, especially uh, showing everyone here that uh, very uh, interesting sentencing tool, as I would understand it. I'm sure there will be many questions about that. Um, we now move from the general uh, grand tableau, as it were, uh, presentation uh, to the particular, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Delphine uh, van Helmisch, who is a scientific uh, researcher at the University of Ghent, uh, uh, who specializes in the application yeah, and execution of so, sentencing. And she has done uh, a, a, a lot of work in relation to the application of the electronic monitoring uh, disposal. So I'm hopeful that Delphine, once we've got the technology up to yes, totally speed, will tell us something about uh, the effect that this order has on individuals and, and how they respond to it, because that is an issue which does inform the debate in Scotland. Uh, and I, I, I know that judges have uh, particular views about this, this kind of disposal and its nature, whether or not it's truly a punishment, etc. Now, are you yes. ready, Delphine? The technology is just waiting. It's just let us down <laughs> a little bit. Well, yes, that it let's will just come. pause. <laughs> While we're waiting for that to catch mm -hmm. up with us, does anyone have any observation or question that they would like to ask of, of Michael at this stage? Yes, a question at the back.
it's the, uh, the probation service in the Netherlands is the one who is doing electronic monitoring and officially is doing the contracts. Uh, uh, While well the contracts are partly together with uh, the RVD part is being contracted by the prison service. The, the, the Dutch probation service has its own contracts about satellite tracking, but running the electronic monitoring is the probation service. So th th that's the one who's responsible for the whole managing the whole process and working with us one month. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Would you like to take your seat sure. then? I think we are ready uh, now to hear from Delphine. So thank you very much, Delphine. Okay. So welcome, everybody. So uh, I'm doing a PhD about experiences of offenders and co-residents with electronic monitoring. But I guess before I can say something about my research, it's important to say something about EM in Belgium and of the importance of experiences of uh, offenders and co-residents. Um, so faced with uh, the problems of prison overcrowding, um, many countries had de developed alternatives to prison sentences. So in 2000, uh, EM in Belgium was extended nationally, and in 2006, it was given an explicit legal basis. So in Belgian law, um, EM is defined as a form of execution of sentence, in the course of which an offender may undergo all or a part of his prescribed prison sentence outside the prison according to a specific schedule. So, and the compliance includes electronic devices. This means that electronic monitoring in Belgium is not a standalone sanction that can be imposed by a judge. So it's used as both a front door approach, so as an alternative to going to prison, but also as a back door approach, as the fact that uh, they, it's a part of their early release uh, after a part uh, in the prison. Uh, the applicable legal framework is dependent on the length of the prison sentence imposed. Uh, so if you're a prison, if you get a prison sentence of uh, three years or less, then uh, it's the responsibility of the prison director. When it's a prison sentence uh, uh, more than three years, then it's an a sort of judge, but it's the judge of the execution of sentence, so not the sentencer. Uh, offenders are subjected in Belgium for RF tagging, so not with the GPS. So this means that uh, the um, transceiver uh, is in the ho house of the uh, offender, and the offender is wearing a bracelet, uh, so they know if he's in or not. Um, recently, also voice recognition is possible in Belgium, uh, and that's for prison sentences up to eight months. But again, it's not a judge uh, who uh, gives electronic monitoring. The research on electronic mon monitoring primarily focuses on financial technical aspects, numbers and recidivism, so these are mostly quantitative studies. But nowadays there are also some experiences research. So with that I mean uh, first there are ranking studies, and these studies the impact of electronic monitoring is mainly derived from the general studies. Uh, so the preference of, for example, ex detainees is asked about uh, the alternatives and about uh, prison. But next to that, there are more um, experienced researchers, like I call them. Um, so uh, they go to offenders or co-residents to ask how it is to live with electronic monitoring. But aside from research by, as you can see, Payne and Ganey, Hucklesby, uh, Roberts, Gibson King, and Martin et al., there is little in-depth experience research uh, next to the process evaluation studies about the beginning of electronic monitoring. So as uh, if you uh, look to the researchers, then you see that a lot of experienced researchers are about the beginning of electronic monitoring, and it's a process evaluation. Um, so there seems to be an unspoken agreement that their views are irrelevant. And however, it's arguable, I guess, that punishment and leniency can only be fully understood if you go to the persons who really experience the sanction. Um, so why should we ex uh, study the experiences? As you know, nowadays, electronic monitoring is hot, and everybody has also an opinion about it. So there are two connected assumptions concerning electronic monitoring, but mostly they're based on beliefs. So for example, the policy thinks that electronic monitoring is a more human alternative for the prison sentences. And also, um, there is a kind of, I call it, uh, and other researchers call it also um, a kind of, uh, a moment. Um, 
Yes, it just means that uh, also the media and persons and the, the public, public uh, think that electronic monitoring is just a soft alternative. So it's an idea that they have in their head, they are just sitting at home and it's an easy thing. But Next to that, also the core residents are important, but currently there is little discussion about the impacts on the innocent third parties and the role that they play in helping to administer a sanction. Nevertheless, research suggests some important reasons why they may not be forgotten, because it's not only a matter of the offender, it also affects the lives of the core residents and next to that, they play an important role in ensuring the success of electronic monitoring. So now I can say something about uh, my PhD because to understand the experience of electronic monitoring, we have set up a qualitative design um, based on experience research in which feelings, experiences and impressions of people who really are confronted with electronic monitoring are emphasized. So as a part of this research, we have done a literature review, but also a bigger empirical research, a qualitative research with interviews. So there are four parts in the empirical research. Um, first of all, I have done uh, 59 interviews with offenders under electronic monitoring, monitoring, 30 with their co-residents, but also 14 with persons with recalled electronic monitoring. So that means that these persons were again in prison. And next to that, I also have uh, had an own experience with electronic monitoring, of, co of course, a scholarly uh, experience, but it was just for knowing better what my respondents uh, were saying. Uh, during the face-to-face -face semi-structured interviews at their home or in prison, uh, I asked them how it was uh, and how it is uh, to live with electronic monitoring, both agreeable but also adverse. So uh, both a positive and a negative. And when possible, uh, I compare it also with their prior prison experience. So as you can see, there are two populations uh, important in my research. First, you have the offenders with electronic monitoring or uh, recalled electronic monitoring. So this research population consists of people um, living in Belgium with electronic monitoring as a sanction. And the fact where they are living and being submitted to EM were inclusion criteria for uh, the research. Potential respondents were contacted and informed about the research in the House of Justice, so that's the probation service in Belgium, uh, in, Hen in Ghent or Bruges, or in the prison of uh, Ghent. And there they get the choice to participate in the research or not. Uh, finally, 73 uh, offenders uh, agreed to be interviewed, and that was a response rate of 74. Next to that, also the co-residents are important, so that are the persons who are living in the same house with the offender. Um, this sample is selected based on two criteria, because um, the first is the, is the criteria of age. It's important that the people uh, were older than 12 years old, because it's important that they first know of electronic monitoring, but they should also understand electronic monitoring. Next to that, it was also important that they were the co-residents of an earlier interviewed offender. So this means that I first interviewed the offender and then I asked the offender if it was possible to interview their co-residents. Only if they agreed uh, to that, I contacted the co-resident. So uh, in total, 30 uh, co-residents agreed to be interviewed and that was a response rate of 75. Uh, when I uh, look to uh, their uh, characteristics, then I can say that the offenders were mostly uh, male and Belgium, and the ages uh, were between uh, 22 and 64. With uh, the co resident it were mostly female uh, Belgian people with an age between 17 and 74. They were mostly partners, family members, or close friends, but mostly it were uh, partners. Before going into the experience of electronic monitoring, it's important to say that it's a comparison between electronic monitoring and imprisonment. An interview showed that this is a crucial nuance because if electronic monitoring follows the prison, it's always very grateful, but if it follows the freedom, the experience can be totally different. So first, I will say something about the experience of offenders. Um, these results all are based on the analysis of uh, 27 interviews because I'm still busy uh, with doing that. It's a huge uh, job, but I guess uh, it says already something uh, about how it is to live with electronic monitoring. 
So from this study, it seems that an experience is very unique. So the views of the interviewed respondents range from satisfied to dissatisfied. So this makes it also difficult to line up the experience of electronic monitoring because it's very individual. Consistent with other research, um, many respondents felt that a preference for, uh, for electronic monitoring was self-evident. Uh, several made comments such as, you must be stupid to sit in jail if you get a choice to electronic monitoring. But not everyone, everyone agreed with that. Uh, two respondents with a prison experience say that uh, at some moments they really preferred uh, imprisonment due to the living conditions. For example, there was one respondent who uh, was living at that moment in a very small studio. He had no social contacts, no uh, perspectives of the future. So he preferred at that moment to go to prison. Afterwards, he gets again uh, the choice to electronic monitoring, and then his, li his life was completely different. And then he chose to, to, to go for electronic monitoring. I say it's possible for an offender to choose. So uh, at the moment, they go to prison for persons with a prison sentence up to three years. They get the choice for electronic monitoring, yes or not. But it's a little bit pushed uh, by the director uh, of the prison, of course, about, uh, because of the prison overcrowding. In line also with the other uh, studies, uh, it seems that uh, they felt electronic monitoring is both a penalty and a favor. So it felt like uh, a kind of imprisonment outside the prison walls. So it means it's not an easy option, but uh, nevertheless, um, being out of prison is also one of the most attractive elements of electronic monitoring, of course. Uh, most respondents experience electronic monitoring uh, not as being overly punitive than uh, a prison sentence, but all respondents mentioned also some disadvantages of electronic monitoring. Of course, the balance is more advantages than uh, disadvantages for most of them, but some uh, really told also to me, uh, next time, uh, never electronic monitoring for me. So you see it's very uh, different. About his social life, uh, EM has again differing effects on the personal relationships with significant others. So you can see on the slide also some quotes of uh, some of my uh, respondents. For some people, their relationship is not changed or even becomes better. For others, it's strained. Respondents were, first of all, very happy to be back at home in their own surroundings. Being able to maintain their family lives uh, is one of the most important elements of electronic monitoring. They can do things together as a family and they can help each other. But next to that, uh, they also mentioned some negative influences on their relationships. EM causes stress and tensions leading to quarrels and discussions which can influence again the relationship. In terms of other social contexts, such as relatives and friends, uh, they are also uh, satisfied with electronic monitoring compared to a prison sentence, but also compared to the freedom. Because now these contexts remain in intact, but sometimes became even better, because now they are more at home, so they see each other um, more in, in time. Uh, a frequently mentioned disadvantage of electronic <coughs> monitoring with respect to the social life is associated with the EM timetable because when a person subject to electronic monitoring spends time with family or friends outside the home, at some times they need to be at home. And mostly it is on this moment that the atmosphere was very good, for example, at a family trip or something, and then they need to go home, which can end the day, of course, at a negative note. As we uh, look at uh, the work, uh, most respondents stated that the possibility of working or undergoing a training is very important uh, with electronic monitoring. Nearly half of uh, the respondents of the 27 uh, were working, so the Belgium EM model is also flexible concerning work and the work hours. Persons who are not working uh, need to search for a job. And of course, they had experienced numerous problems with that, not only because of the bracelet, but also because of their criminal record. Many respondents uh, decided to hide their bracelet and even lie about it, because they were afraid that it would be impossible to find a job when they say that they have electronic monitoring. Um, of course, uh, this uh, leads to problems because they cannot be as flexible as other employees uh, to find a job. If someone is calling them an employee uh, that they can come, then they can always do it because of the time schedule, of course. Um, nevertheless, some of my respondents also uh, have no uh, problems with finding a job. It goes very uh, well. So again, there is a lot of difference. 
Uh, about the finances, uh, some financial drawbacks are also associated with electronic monitoring. One of the EM conditions is that uh, the offender should always be able to phone or be phoned. Uh, respondents reported that making these calls to Brussels, it is in Belgium, so the um, center where they are controlled, uh, becomes expensive. In addition, they also need to go to their probation officer, which costs money uh, again to, to uh, be there, of course. Um, about the freedom, some respondents, mainly those with experience with prison sentence, were satisfied with the freedom they get. Uh, they accepted that EM is still a penalty and they realized the value of the word freedom. An often mentioned advantage of electronic monitoring by, by those with a previous prison sentence was the relative freedom of choice. Now they have the feeling that they could live their own life. They could do whatever they want as long as they stay in their own house. It are mostly the daily routine that they greatly appreciate in electronic monitoring. For example, now they can choose when they get up, they can choose when they go to sleep, they can choose what to watch on television. For us, it are details, but in prison, you can choose that. And for that reason, they really appreciate electronic monitoring and the freedom they get. But of course, uh, some people did report also some difficulties with the degree of freedom they get. They felt limited in the, local, in the use they could make of the local space as well as their home. So respondents who needed to rely on the public transport are, are tied to a particular geographical area. So if you're living not in a city, then it's really hard to get to the shop. It takes a lot of time. Um, also, other respondents resented the limitations on their ho own house by the boundaries of electronic monitoring. For example, some respondents can go to their own garden or can go to the uh, hallway of the apartment building. Um, next to that, several respondents reported also the disadvantage that they can go outside when they wish. Especially in the beginning, that this was a big adjustment because they aren't used to. For example, when they forgot something in a store, they need to undertake themselves to stay at home. They know that they can just open the door and walk outside, but they have to uh, rely themselves to stay at home. So a lot of self-discipline is really uh, necessary uh, to do that. The limits on freedom is the one element that makes EM really uh, hard uh, for some uh, persons. Uh, especially young persons uh, have a lot of temptations because they know, for example, in summer all their friends are outside and they need to stay at home. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard uh, to accept that. About the emotional effects, uh, mentally uh, and emotionally, EM can be harder than anticipated because Interviews reported the importance of being able to get over the idea of being watched. Uh, so if not, this pressure could make them ill, they said, um, which illustrates how hard EM can be mentally. Of course, that's not only the case for uh, electronic monitoring. They also say that about uh, the prison sentence. Uh, Interviews in our study reported that they have to be very strict about time, which could cause, of course, a great deal of stress. So they felt hurried and they have to rush to get everything done. Some lived also with a sense of fear because they were afraid that something would go wrong and they really feel insecure because of that. Uh, because they always think that if I do something wrong, I have to go to prison and that's something I really don't want to do. Uh, views about the visibility of electronic monitoring devices are also very divergent. So some thought it was a great advantage that EM devices could easily uh, be put under their clothes so they can conceal it from the others that they have a punishment, which of course uh, make uh, sure that they not face a stigma. This is in big contrast to imprisonment where the uh, person is taken out of the neighborhood and everybody knows that something is happening uh, with him. Others, however, found that the bracelet was very obtrusive and resented it. So the visibility of the bracelet resulted in adaptation and avoidance strategies. Uh, as you can see uh, at the slide also, a woman uh, don't want to wear a skirt because everybody uh, should see that uh, she was wearing a bracelet. So for that, uh, she chose uh, to wear trousers. Uh, the current assumption among the public and the media that EM is merely a slap on the wrist, uh, allowing offenders to enjoy all the benefits of being at home in conditions similar to the free world, does not have an empirical basis. This experience research shows that offenders experience electronic monitoring not as being overly punitive, just like uh, the prison, but uh, it shows that uh, some persons and at some moments the 
prison is preferred, so it's not just something uh, soft. Offenders mentioned positive things about electronic monitoring, um, such as the freedom of choice, uh, the possibility to be at home and work. Uh, it's very important for them and, of course, for not being in the prison. Uh, although they also talk about the tough aspects, such as the psych psychological impact on them, but also the fact that it's a limited and controlled uh, freedom they have. These psychological impacts, uh, uh, I mean with that uh, stress, tensions, fear, also the fact that their uh, social life is limited. They see that uh, the co-residents are uh, going away, but she or he uh, does have to stay uh, at home. It's very hard mentally. In prison, they know that something is happening outside, but they are not confronted with it uh, in a direct way. Uh, although its disadvantages did not outweigh the big advantages uh, for most respondents when compared to the prison sentence. So this research found that EM had a punitive impact on the lives of the, uh, co of the offenders and the co-residents, like I will say uh, in a minute. And it was also experienced as a valid and a constructive sanction. I mean that a lot of uh, persons really saw electronic monitoring as something good. Uh, they, they, it's does something good with their lives because now they have an excuse uh, to their bad friends uh, because they need to be at home, for example. It also gives a lot of structure to the persons. A uh, woman uh, who was in prison told to me that she was happy that she first get electronic monitoring before the total freedom because now she can go to a disco and uh, get in trouble. So she learned step by step to be back uh, in the community. Um, our research are generally in agreement with other researchers, uh, but of course with some differences and nuances. But this says something about uh, the Belgian model, uh, which was characterized with uh, a flexible structure and also a joint um, planning of the timetables with the justice assistant. I said was, because recently it's changed in Belgium uh, for some uh, persons with electronic monitoring. So in March, the law was changed uh, for uh, 66 persons of persons with electronic monitoring and that's the group from, of front door so the persons with a prison sentence up to three years for example the uh, joint planning of uh, the timetable is not necessary anymore because it's fixed now uh, it's a fixed schedule so the probation officers are coming now uh, at the background and it's more the offender he has to do it by himself um, so the integration that is very important is now going a little bit away in Belgium I say for one group, so the others with a prison sentence more than three years are, are still uh, uh, a combination of control and assistance. Uh, so I guess uh, that the assumptions of the public and the polic policy need to be a little bit refined. It's not as soft as it is uh, thought. Um, now about the experiences of the co-residents. Um, I will say that the uh, experience of the co-residents is uh, a little bit in two ways. Uh, first, there is the influence on their lives, but next to that, they also play an important role uh, in electronic monitoring. If we ask them uh, how they experience electronic monitoring, the majority of the respondents tell us about the good experiences. Although some respondents also uh, start selling about for them the negative experiences, but for most respondents, the advantages are more important than the disadvantages because, again, they compare electronic monitoring with imprisonment. Moreover, they know that it's just for a temporary period in their lives and afterwards it will be able to pick up their normal lives again. But after a while, they always mention some changes because of electronic monitoring. So they often say that it isn't bad at all, but at the same time, it became clear that their lives are uh, influenced on a negative way because of electronic monitoring. The most important uh, advantage for co-residents uh, is the fact that the offender is back at home and doesn't have to go or stay in prison. So for those whose co-residents have been imprisoned, several positive consequences are mentioned. For example, they don't have to visit the prison. Um, also, the offender is not uh, together with other uh, offenders. And most important, the family stays together. So this latter means that the co-resident is no longer alone and they can do things together uh, as a family. Next to that, um, they are also a little bit at ease because they know, thanks to electronic monitoring, 
first where the contact is, but also when he or she will be back at home. So the times that they are waiting uh, with their uh, food uh, is over. They know, uh, for example, at seven o'clock he will be back home and then we can eat. Beforehand, it was sometimes uh, waiting for a couple of hours until he was back uh, at home. Important for them is that the offender is working so uh, that he can earn some money and uh, instead of being at home all day. Because also taking someone at home costs money and when, you, when the uh, offender is working, he can earn some money which can compensate the costs. But of course, that's not always uh, the fact. Um, despite these advantages, I guess that the negative influences on uh, the lives of the co-residents may not be uh, minimized. The co-residents often feel punished because of the direct and indirect influence of electronic monitoring on their own lives. Many of the conditions imposed are also um, experienced by them, which leads to feelings of punishment and control for the co-residents. The daily life of some co-residents co are greatly disturbed by just giving accommodation to an offender. Uh, activities are often adapted to the schedule of the controlled, but by this uh, I mean that they stay also at home just like the offender and doesn't go away to a barbecue of a party that they are invited to because they don't want to go alone and explain that uh, their partner or uh, family uh, can go uh, with them. Because they are so often together, it's possible that tensions arise, which can influence the relation, of course. It's also clear that uh, electronic monitoring influences their social life. So this means that co-residents are feeling that their lives uh, are influenced uh, in an important way. Uh, friends uh, don't come always at home. In the beginning, they will come. But of course, they, will, they also want to hide that there is electronic monitoring in, in the house. So some people also say uh, that uh, visits uh, are uh, not uh, possible uh, now. A few minutes, thank you. Yes, uh, I'm at the end. So next to the experience, uh, the influence on their lives, uh, they also play an important role. So the co-residents feel responsible for uh, the correct implementation of electronic monitoring. Therefore, they play a key role in uh, supervision and support. This means that the offenders are relieved and at the same time controlled by the co-residents. The co-residents become supervisors for the program, controlling the uh, offenders themselves and prodding them to comply with the, pre with the program demands. They try everything to support the uh, offender. For example, when the offender isn't at home five minutes in advance, they start telephoning them. So they ask them, hey, where are you? You need to be at home now. Uh, so they are doing this especially because they're afraid that something would go wrong and that the police will come and that the convicts uh, need to go back or have to go to prison. Next to that, they also give some moral support, so they motivate the offender to go on and they listen to them when electronic monitoring becomes difficult. And finally, they, all, they are also charged with extra additional tasks. For example, uh, they need to look for the children uh, when they are going outside, uh, they have to do the paperwork and so on. So the co-residents have the feeling that they need to do everything by themselves, especially those things that the offender cannot do anymore. And this uh, can weigh down on them. So you can see that they are supervisors, they are a sort of a guide and also an assistant. So the general conclusion for the uh, co-residents is that the benefits of electronic monitoring are again more important than the experienced harm. So they are punished indirectly and the uh, the mentioned inconveniences do not exceed the big advantage of being together again. This doesn't count for all the co-residents because some co-residents co really have the feeling of being punished because of electronic monitoring. As I said, we see two big influences on the lives of the uh, co-residents. First, the spillover effects. With that, I mean that uh, co -residents, uh, the lives of the co-residents is really influenced by electronic monitoring. And, uh, for example, their daily life is interrupted as a limitation of the social life and they adapt themselves to the schedule of the controlled as they do not go outside without the offender. Second, some housemates also have the feeling of becoming a guard. Uh, for example, I, I told it uh, they start telephoning them when the time is up and so on. And next to that, they also support uh, the offender. Above mentioned disadvantages and additional tasks may not be underestimated, even though most co-residents accept it in exchange uh, for the presence of the offender. There, there are housemates who really suffer because of electronic monitoring, and the impact uh, of uh, electronic monitoring on, on co-residents is often little recognized, uh, with the lack of information and um, 
assistance as a result. Also in Belgium, um, most co-residents do not get some additional emotional or practical assistance. But this research shows that it could be very helpful for, for some of them because of the additional pressure on them, but also because they really play an important role in uh, electronic monitoring. So um, given the recent pressures on the government and the growth in technology, I guess that electronic monitoring really has a future in the judicial world. It's a new and another way of punishment at which private actors and other actors are intensely activated. The government takes a backseat while the responsibility of offenders and co-residents is now more important. A characteristic of this sentence is that it draws upon the social network of the uh, offender for achieving some of its objectives. However, the effects of this sentence is amplified through these networks and the lives of some peoples are greatly affected by it. So therefore, the challenge is to consider uh, co-residence as an integral part, not only for EM, but also for other sentences, and uh, to be aware of the collateral consequences that electronic monitoring has on the lives of persons, of course. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Delphine, for those uh, fascinating insights into the implications and the practicalities uh, of the order for those who are subject to the order and those who have to live with it. Now, we do have in the open session just about 30 minutes or so, uh, and uh, Cyrus has asked me to say to you that when you're asking a question, um, we are recording what's going on, but the questions, uh, the voice of the questioner will not be part of the final edit, so any question that you ask will simply come up yeah. as text on the screen, and we hope that information will uh, help to make people feel a bit less inhibited when they're asking questions. Um, just by way of information to the audience, I should say to you that uh, my own research, is, and I'll be corrected by Mike on this, who's the expert, Mike Nellis, is that we've had this order of restriction of liberty since about October of 1990. Seven and the statistics which I have come across in the National Statistics Publication for Scotland for the first decade of this century show that, you know, uh, uh, at the start of the decade there were about there were actually 656 of these orders pronounced by sheriff courts, and over that 10 years, we th there was an increase to the middle of the decade, where we plateaued uh, at about 1,179 over a couple of years, and then a drop again uh, to the figure in 2011-2012, which was 602. So you can see we're at the start of the decade about 600 doubles almost, and then halves. So that's how we have um, imposed the orders. Does anyone have an observation or a question? Yes. Right now, uh, we have 120 EM specialists who do uh, the techniques. Who, go, when a company goes there, they accompany it and they get all the information from the provider. They make the interpretation of it, and they have the so that the, they they handle the EM and they handle the supervision. It's in one hand. Um, and what the company does, they monitors the, the, the electronic monitoring and gives the information to the to the uh, to the 120 specialists right now. But we what we said in the end is we're going to make a separation out of that. We we basically uh, what we said is EM is a service uh, to the probation uh, officer to the, who has the supervision, um, but that does not mean he has to do anything at all with electronic monitoring himself. So we're going to have a very small group of people who, are, who really want to be specialists, who are going to work with the web store, who are going to uh, exactly know what's, what's coming out there, who's going to, who, and I couldn't show that because it was past my half hour, who are going to give the exact advice of one of the 11 products that, that, he gonna, that is going to be advised to court. And he's going to give weekly status information to the probation officer about the whereabouts, about the electronic monitoring, and an advice in how to handle. That's the idea. So we're going to concentrate it, make it smaller. But but the, the assumption is like um, it's still it's good to be in a probation office because on one hand they work on the evidence-based interventions and, and on the other hand they use the information from electronic monitoring. So it's uh, 
combination you have to be careful with and proud uh, uh, about. That's what we think. All right, thank you. Uh, other question? Yes, please, at the back. Well, there, there, there can be a, a nuance on that because when, it, when you're in the pre-trial phase and when you're a serious sexual, uh, a sexual offender, you're not very uh, easily will get electronic monitoring because in that phase the crime is too serious and you stay in jail until you are on trial. But at the end of, of detention, uh, then it's an extra tool, uh, uh, and even though you consider it as a high risk, because uh, you, uh, uh, then it's an extra tool at the end of that to put them on electronic monitoring. At the end of the phase that somebody has is to have his jail time, that's especially with sex offenders. And uh, once again, and I, 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 um, uh, the European Treaty uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the right of offenders to, to remain in freedom as much as possible before they go to trial gets more and more criticized on the Netherlands, and I don't know how that goes with, with Scotland, but the judges are more getting criticized because they put easily put people in jail before trial. They keep them too long in jail. So what, what we, and, and I think we should uh, take that serious because it's, it's, it's a fundamental right, and sometimes it cannot be done. I mean, this, the public, you have to. Uh, there's a, a shock in society when something serious has has happened. So you, sometimes it's too serious to keep somebody uh, 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 out of jail. But um, that's one pressure part. So it's still high, pretty high risk offenders in the pre-sentence phase still go out if, if if possible because of that Article Four. And at the end of detention, and then it's better off putting them out with electronic monitoring than just let them on the street just like that then high-risk offenders can also have electronic monitoring. It's a slightly separate subject, but that's absolutely correct. The European Union's door statistics, as they call them, are shocking for Scotland, and these bail uh, or, or uh, remand figures, uh, we are on a par with Turkey. Other questions? Absolutely, and it's both, and, and it was in Dutch, but you could, if you could see at the web store, like there was also, it was say reckless, reckless hearing on the side of it, that's for probation service, so we try uh, uh, as well, uh, the, 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 for us the clue, and we're testing it right now, we, having, we have more than 50 requests in a few months in a small pilot from prosecutors and from probation, we try to make EM as easy as possible and make clear what it is. And what you, I completely agree with you. I think on one hand the judges should be educated and there's no f formal reason why not to do it. But also does not give, uh, uh, makes it, uh, does not mean that probation officers should not advise judges and be, be sharp in the work that they're doing. So they, they should, it's both ways in my opinion. But, but, but we... Yeah, but, but maybe in Hull, but maybe we expect too much of our professionals. But because one of the one of the conclusions we had that, in general, the, the, that was kind of shocking for us in in, in the analyzing that how how, the, how how big the conceptual confusion about electronic monitoring is. Uh, when I see it when in my, in my court sessions, when I because I'm, I'm I have a passion for EM, so I ask my colleagues and say, you know, what, what do you think of EM? Well, it's about a bracelet, right? And it's about schemes. And it's like, um, and it's weird too in the Netherlands because if, if you, uh, as a judge, put on a sentence, like for example, you put somebody in jail or you give them community sentence, you know exactly what you're gonna do. If you're gonna give them a fine, you're gonna, you know, you put up the height, you know what you're gonna do. In Holland, and I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not talking for the sheriffs here because I'm not too familiar with the Scottish situation, but I would make a, a bet on it that it would not be completely different. Like electronic monitoring is just a wild guess. It's a black box. If you, for example, you don't know, I think as a judge you should know what electronic monitoring is. Uh, you, you should be able to make a judgment about the proportionality, what, 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 what it's going to be, how long it's going to be, what are, what are the proportionality in the exclusion zone that's being used. It's, it's a judgment as a judge you should be interested in because right. it has impact. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this gentleman here. Um, when I was, uh, uh, I, in the past I worked with the prosecutor's office and I was, I was so a manager at the Dutch probation service 
And in my region, I have one time had a, a child of 14 uh, on electronic monitoring. Uh, and I had some sleepless nights about that, about doing that. But the, the, the alternative was that um, uh, he had to go to jail. So it was a sort of, of keeping him in the family, keeping him uh, 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 doing that. But it's still a 14-year-old kid. But I decided to do it because I thought it's, 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 a, it's a better way, it's a better situation. Um, basically, when I when it comes to we we did low prof low project low profile project with juveniles, but we we we, we try now to uh, extend that with intensive probation supervision from the youth department when it comes to probation, and w the the main part we the difference we do with um, uh, uh, with with adults is that we give them more uh, we use it more in a structural way. Because the whole theory behind using the criminal justice system for juveniles is completely for different than for adults, who we consider as being completely responsible for their own acts. But we think with juveniles you should have be more patience, use it more to structure, and give them more time to make mistakes. Like for example, for an adult, when they make a mistake with electronic monitoring, you're easily willing to report them back to to uh, the courts. But with juveniles, but uh, you you can give more space. You can be more uh, uh, relaxed with that. So. In, it helps more to structure. So I, I, I believe in using it for juveniles, um, and the age is, is a sort of a difficult, for me it's also a difficult uh, issue. Uh, um, but in the, the program theory behind using electronic monitoring with juveniles should be different than with adults, and it should, help, I think, help it more with structuring lives of them. Yes, it is interesting because it is competent for us to impose a tag on a child, but the report should address what supports the local authority has for the child put in that, in that position. Uh, gentleman at the back, please. Yeah, and also you keep him out of the place where the crime has been committed. You keep him out of the center where, where, where the fighting was. Um, about, uh, see if I get it correctly, I will have to work on my English. Um, in Holland, we still think that use of electronic monitoring um, should be something selective. It should not be widely used with everybody, and it's easy to say, make it a standalone version and do it in low profiles, because then you sort of open the gates to the more use of electronic monitoring. So, for example, in Holland, we also say it's only a judge who decides when electronic monitoring is being put on somebody, because we consider it as a condition which limits somebody's freedom. It's not like it's... It, uh, Delphin had, an, uh, I think, an, an excellent presentation about that. It's not... It's, it's a serious thing to be put on electronic monitoring. We think so. We should be selective with the use of electronic monitoring, and we should always have a judge who makes the decision about using electronic monitoring or not. And when it comes to Serious offenders, I mean, um, a, a, a serious high risk and serious offenders, that's only in certain phases of the judicial system. So when somebody's, uh, I mean, if you, if you have a, somebody who rapes somebody, will definitely be in jail because we have a maximum of four years in that, and then you will certainly not get out of jail before trial. But when somebody, at the end of the four years, it could be interesting when it's still pretty risk and he goes back to the neighborhood but people are waiting for him and for example that kind of thing it's still interesting to have electronic monitoring then to have him on certain areas or not so we we we, we sort of made a fundamental in holland i think we made a sort of a fundamental choice by not not using electronic monitoring on low maybe it's in the, in the in the risk assessment and in the in the terms you use in the language but we, we still think it should be selective use of electronic monitoring and not being and because it's an it's an impact on somebody's freedom, it, it it's not not a light thing that shows all the, all the investigation and that's why we sh we think we should not use it with everybody and it's a low risk. We'll let them put them uh, put them uh, on electronic monitoring, and and as well maybe one thing uh, and I don't know if but I'm thinking aloud now using electronic monitoring, uh, we, uh, we mentioned that briefly. Uh, if you do that as a substitution for jail. Uh, 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 if you introduce, uh, and I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that has been done with electronic monitoring in a lot of countries. If you think that it's an easy solution for being for having somebody in jail, and then we have electronic monitoring, the same discussion goes in the Netherlands now because we have a crisis, cut down spendings, closing prisons, put people on electronic monitoring for six months. I think that's basically a wrong strategic position of giving electronic monitoring a chance. It's not if you w if, once again if you want to put somebody 
if you want to have somebody in jail, you have to do that. People can still cut through the, 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 the bracelet and people is out. So that's a matter of managing the expectations to the politicians and the press. But it's better than nothing. All right, thank, thank you. I'll just ask Delphi if you have any contributions to make in response to the question. And then I'll take one more question, I think, given the hour. Yes, so in Belgium, it's indeed completely, completely different. So all the offences are possible for electronic monitoring. And I guess, indeed, for the uh, high-risk offenders, it's indeed uh, something very useful. Offenders also told that to me because, for example, they were 13 years in prison. I also spoke at a murderer, for example. And he told me now, for me, it was possible to step-by-step step, uh, going into the uh, experience of the of the community because they were in prison, they were used to the prison life, and now they get back. And everything has changed, but with electronic monitoring, there's a form of control and assistance that helps them. So it's, for me, it's very useful to use it also with high profile uh, offenders. Right, thank you. Final question, Michael. I think that was an observation. There was a question uh, 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 from the robe in front, Michael. And, uh, and after that, I think I'm going to ask Mike just to, to kind of round it off for us. Yes, please. Yes, so in Belgium, it's not possible to put juveniles with electronic monitoring, but I have uh, interviewed persons uh, from 20, 22 until 64. So, um, and I guess uh, about the temptations, there's indeed a difference, but it's not only uh, with age, uh, it's also with the character of the person. For example, when someone who likes to be at home, electronic monitoring is not such a punishment like a person who likes to be outside the home. But I have seen that uh, younger people uh, have friends who are going outside. Uh, they want to go away uh, at the dancing, and now it's impossible. And for them, it's indeed uh, more difficult because mostly they are not working, so they are more at home. For them, it's, for them, it's really hard uh, to beat the temptations. Uh. All right, thank you very much. And the final observation or question, Mike Nellis. So mostly there is not a lot, of, a lot of time to do because there is a lot of caseload uh, with electronic monitoring in Belgium. But some uh, justice assistants really try to do. So when I heard uh, co-residents about the assistance they get of uh, the uh, justice assistance, it's different. Some said there is no help for me. Others say really the justice assistant is very great for me. Uh, she's listening to me. She is really a help for me. But it's really dependent of the justice assistant. Um, so, and I guess uh, some co-residents really don't need it also. It's, they say, for me, it's not necessary. Uh, it's not my punishment. It's the punishment of uh, the offender, and I have nothing to do with it. Others, however, say it's, uh, yes, it's uh, hard for me, and I really wanted that there was something for me, and there's nothing for me. So for that reason, I guess it's important to have the opportunity, <coughs> but not that it's um, obliged to do it. So just listen to them because a lot of uh, co-residents also told to me, now I ha I'm happy that I can talk about it to someone because they are also afraid to talk about it with the offender because they know that the offender uh, had it sometimes very hard with electronic monitoring and that they don't want to uh, make it harder for the offender because everything is really uh, centered on the offender. Uh, it needs to be good for them and I'm the second place. And that's how co-residents really experience it. All right. Thank you all very much. We, I'm sure we could go on all night uh, discussing this. It's a fascinating uh, subject. And I hope that people will uh, stay behind during the refreshment phase and uh, ask our guests some uh, questions that haven't been v ventilated here. It just brings home to me the importance of these lectures and this lecture series and raising awareness, uh, the importance of uh, the need for the constant uh, professional lifelong commitment to uh, self-informing oneself and uh, within this uh, 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 lecture that, that, that we've had the importance that each stage of the process has to inform itself and educate itself as to uh, the implications for the order. Uh, I, I, I was particularly taken by the holistic 
aspect of the Dutch order uh, by the flexibility which is contained within the way in which it can be used. But most important, and it has been touched upon here, uh, perhaps in Scotland we have not been as, as, as courageous and ad, um, adventurous in developing uh, the use of electronic monitoring. And as I said at the SASO conference when after Mike had spoken that perhaps uh, it is time for uh, a, a rethink uh, about uh, what great potential is locked in these orders and the good use that they can be put to. Now, with those short concluding remarks of my own, uh, I think, Dean, we uh, call upon you now just to uh, conclude our deliberations with a short vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, it will be short because I don't want to stand, uh, in a sense, in between you and uh, the reception. Uh, I think you'll agree with me that I think the presentations have been really insightful. They've been really stimulating, I think, in terms of the questions which they have provoked which in a sense was my experience also of the first seminar, so we've continued that uh, tradition. Uh, and I think also, uh, in, in a sense, they've been remarkably complementary in the sense that one was about broad systems and the other was about the experience of those systems. So I'm not sure whether you coordinated your presentations beforehand, but it's been remarkable, I think, in the coordination of them today. So thank you very much to our two presenters. Uh, and also, thank you very much to Sheriff uh, Welsh for giving so generously of your time in your chairing of the session today. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, and this is a finally, I, I couldn't let the mention of Bruce Springsteen go. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are interested in judicial celebrity uh, rather than the musical kind, I just want to advertise one event which is coming up on Monday the 4th of, uh, sorry, Monday the 1st of July, which is the first John Fitzsimmons Memorial Lecture, which will be given by Justice Albie Sachs. I'm not sure how you got Justice Albie Sachs here, but I think this is a, a real coup. And I think like Bruce Springsteen, it won't be quite in Hampden Park, but I think you need to book early. <laughs> so I think... And there's also one on the Tuesday, the 2nd of July as well. Justice Alvy Sachs uh, will be, is it's discussion, I think, or chairing a discussion. I think that's right, isn't it? So two events to put in your calendar, almost equivalent to Bruce Springsteen. Thank you.